Okay, so for this unit, we're gonna start looking at the idea of electrostatics, and the first part of it is gonna be some review um, in terms of the initial quantities. So the first quantity we're looking at is the idea of electric charge, and we saw that with the electricity unit. This is just an intrinsic quantity. It just is, there's no explaining why some things have a positive charge and some things have a negative charge. It can innately have a particular charge. If you recall, the symbol for it was a lowercase q, and the units for it were coulombs. And we abbreviated that as a capital C. And last chapter, we looked at the movement of charges. And in this chapter, we're gonna look at how charges interact with each other. And charges interact with each other by exerting forces on each other. And you should have seen a little bit of this in chemistry, just the idea that opposite charges attract each other and like charges repel each other. And so we're gonna kind of look at the mathematical nature of that and just kind of some conceptual examples and consequences of that attraction repulsion nature of charges. Um, so let's look at uh, the two kind of categories that materials fall into. And again, we talked a little bit about this in the previous chapter with electricity. Uh, we're gonna delve into it a little bit more in this chapter. Uh, so the idea that the materials fall into one of two categories, either conductors or insulators. Um, and the idea of conductors, we can kind of have a little bit of wiggle room there. But something that is defined as a conductor is gonna be a material that readily allows charges to move through it. Material that really allows charges to move through it. And we kind of just verbally talked about this in the previous chapter, but these tend to be solids. And what makes a material a good electrical conductor is the same reasoning that it makes it a good um, thermal conductor in that a solid, the molecules are stuck to each other, and so it's very easy for an electron to make its way through them if the molecules are stuck to each other. So these tend to be solids. Of solids, um, metals tend to be the better conductors. And another way to think about um, a conductor is a conductor is something that has a low resistance value. And again, that relates to the previous chapter um, with resistance there. So we're looking at conductors as a material that is going to either readily take electrons or that does not want to readily take electrons. Okay. So that's conductors. The next uh, grouping are the insulators. And so these are going to be materials that do not readily allow charges to flow through. So these kind of materials, insulators are going to be materials that not only is it hard for charges to flow through them, but it's just hard to take charges off of them. Like they hold on to their charges pretty well. Okay, that's going to be something that's an insulator. Um, so in general, gases and liquids tend to be good insulators. In that... It's harder for an electron to travel in a given direction in a gas or a liquid just because the molecules can move around. Um, but you can still have solids that are good insulators and usually those solids are materials that have trapped air inside them or a trapped gas inside them. So for example, like rubber. Rubber is a very porous material. It's got all these air pockets in there. So that is material that um, doesn't allow charges to really move through. Uh, another example, wood, plastic. Again, those are porous materials that have these air pockets, okay? So that's what makes them a good insulator. Um, and again, it's not that they don't, it's, it's not just that they don't allow charges to move freely through them, but it's that it's hard to take an electron off of them, 
Okay, so that's what makes something a good insulator. And then there are these in-between materials, and those are semiconductors and superconductors. And so semiconductors are going to be materials that can play the role of conductor or insulator depending on its parameters, depending on its environment. So a semiconductor may behave like an insulator until you give it a certain amount of voltage difference. And once it goes past a particular voltage difference, then it behaves like a conductor. Um, semiconductors are the metalloids or the semi-metals. Silicon is one of the most popular semiconductors. Um, and it's just useful in electronics because it has that dual personality where it can behave like an insulator or it can behave like a conductor. Superconductors are materials that effectively provide no resistance. And realistically, um, right now, we don't have materials that can behave like a superconductor at room temperature or at plausible temperatures that you would actually interact with. Usually to have a superconductor, you have to get to be really, really, really cold. And the colder you make the material, the less the um, atoms are jostling around. And so we're reducing the resistance. And so it allows the electrons to move in freely. Um, we're not going to really look into any more depth of the superconductor, but that's just kind of uh, another category you could have material. So those are kind of the four different groupings you would have. And as we have charges kind of moving around in our system, one way that we can have charges moving around is a process called grounding. And you should have heard of this word before when we talked about the safety mechanisms in a circuit and just the idea of that third prong, that grounding prong. So the definition of grounding is providing a path to the ground for excess electrons to disperse into the earth. So oftentimes when you are working with electronics, usually you have yourself grounded or you have the material grounded. And again, that's just another safety mechanism. So instead of the electrons going into you, they go into this alternate path into the earth and they can just spread out. The earth is so large and so big that it can take lots of excess electrons just kind of spread out throughout the surface and not have a, a significant amount of charge in one spot. Okay. So grounding is just providing a path for electrons to disperse. Because if electrons, if you have a whole bunch of electrons in one region, they're gonna wanna spread out. They don't wanna be near each other. They're all like charges, and like charges don't like being near each other. Okay. So let's talk about this idea of, well, how can you actually get charged objects? Um, and so that's kind of to do with the atomic structure, because you've been hearing me talk about the electrons moving, the electrons moving, the electrons moving. Um, and why don't I ever talk about the idea of protons moving? So if we look at atomic structure, again, this should be a little bit of chemistry with you. There are two things in an atom, in a molecule, that actually have charge. And those are your protons and those are your electrons. So if you were to look at the charge of a proton, charge of a proton is positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And the charge of an electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. They have the same magnitude of charge, but they're opposite signs. And in the previous chapter, we didn't so much worry about the negative sign for an electron. We just worried about the fact that it was 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. In this chapter, we're going to look at the fact that it's got a positive or negative nature because that's going to tell us if something's actually attracting or repelling. So if we think about the atomic structure, you've got the proton, which is inside the nucleus, and you've got the electrons that are like whirling around the outside. And so all this time when I've been talking about charges and the movement of charges, the reason I've been saying it's the electrons that move is because the proton is it's bound inside the nucleus. It is really hard to get the proton out of the nucleus. In fact, it takes quite a bit of energy to split that nucleus apart to pull out the proton. Whereas the electrons, the electrons can easily slough off or they can usually gain one. And so you, it's very readily occurring that you would have these positive or negative ions 
where you have electrons either being gained or being lost. So almost all charging is due to the gain or loss of an electron. So for example, if I have um, material and let's say it's neutral, okay, it starts off neutral and it has 12, 20 protons and 20 electrons. That means it's neutral. It's got 20 positives, 20 negatives, charges cancel out, it's neutral. If all of a sudden I lose two electrons, if I lose two electrons, then I've got 20 protons and I have 18 electrons. That means I have a deficit of two electrons. I have two more protons than I do have electrons. So two of these protons are not being canceled out. So if I were to look at the charge of this thing, the charge of this thing is the charge of two protons, which would just be two, I didn't leave enough room, two, times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, which is 3.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Okay. If I lose two electrons, I have two protons that are not being canceled out, so I have this charge of two protons. Uh, let me do one other example. Let's say I have a neutral object and I have 40 protons and I have 40 electrons. So right now this is neutral. Let's say that I gain three electrons, okay? If I gain three electrons, then now I'm gonna have 40 protons and I'm gonna have 43 electrons. So this means that there are three electrons not being canceled. So I have three excess electrons. So the charge of this object is gonna be the charge of three electrons, which would be three times negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, because that's the charge of one electron. So the charge would be three times negative one, so that'd be negative 4.8 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Okay. So you're either, you're a positive charge if you lose electrons, you're a negative charge if you gain electrons, and you can actually figure out what that value of charge is if you know the exact number of electrons that you're gonna gain or lose, okay? Okay, so that finishes kind of the lecture on the introduction to um, electrostatics, introduction to electric charge. Uh, and then the next lecture is gonna be on methods of charging.